Hi, this is Bugani X Podcast. Uh, uh, we continue our continuing our discussion with uh, uh, Richard Minsky, uh, bookbinder and book artist, Bugani teacher, and many things more. Uh, we started uh, a, 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 some time ago uh, with the first chapter. Here is the second chapter. Let's proceed. And uh, uh, what kind of uh, art were you yourself doing in those years, like late seventies, say? Mid seventies, let's say. Mid, mid mid to late seventies. Those were some bleak years. Oh, no, oh, I was on Bleecker Street. <laughs> those were bleaker years. Um, let's see. What's um? What was I doing that here? Well, I don't know. Uh, do, do, what do you do? You see? Do you see Minsky.com here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you go there, and if you go to the catalog of bindings, right? You can see the stu- You can see links, and if you and if you uh, you can click here at the top and that should why is that not going down that's supposed to that's supposed to take you to the bottom of the page but uh, i have to go over this site you know i started this site in 1993 and the pages i put up then are still i just add Uh, i know that when i said my site you said you need to have a guide to it because it is a rabbit hole and uh uh there, there are there are here when I start with the, these are pages that I put up in 1993, but this is this is what I did. That you saw these from not here. This was the first book that I sold to an art dealer in 1971 to Alan Stone, and I just uh, you know abstract. It was kind of bookbinder's version of abstract expressionism, where I took these little shavings of leather and just uh, made a pattern, which is kind of like a flock of birds or a question mark, uh, or it, it, it's subject to interpretation. So it's kind of decorative art with a bit of a metaphoric twist to it. And I was doing my own marbling then, you know, and, uh, and like that. But um, uh, so yeah, anybody can just go here, 1970. Here, this is what I was doing even before the Center for Book Arts, back when uh, I had my shop in Forest Hills on this, my storefront in Queens. Uh, one of my customers bought in a book for repair. He had a copy of Pettigrew's History of Egyptian Mummies from uh, 1973, uh, and I, in 1973. And he, he was a, he had brought me a number of books. I had been doing the Villard books for him, you know, the Livre d'Artiste, the, um, um, the Henry Moore books, uh, the, um, uh, uh, I, I have to probably even figure out what, what it was I was doing for him then. But I was doing these big books and boxes and stuff on of that uh, of that 1930s, 20s and 30s kind of French livre d'art I was doing. But he brought in this book for repair. And I had just gotten from Talis a bolt of airplane linen, very fine weaved linen, which I used for hinges and things like that. And I put down the book after he left. And it just happened to go on my table on top of the linen. And the book said to me, oh, I want to be wrapped in that linen. I want to be like a mummy. So that became my first material meets metaphor work. And uh, I cut linen into strips and I wrapped it up like a mummy. So it looked like a mummified book on the shelf. And I thought he might freak out, but he loved it. <laughs> and um, uh, so that, uh, that I, I discovered that not only did I have fun making it, but somebody actually wanted it. And uh, so that's what I was doing in terms of book art uh, then. Uh, the, the next important one was uh, the birds of North America. And um, w- one of my um, bookbinding students went off to Hollywood to become a famous actor, which he did. And uh, he, had, he had bought students birds of North America, which needed covers to do as his bonding project. So he said, I'm not gonna be able to get to this. Do you want it? You can do something with it. I said, sure. I went out to lunch that day and there's a guy in the corner selling pheasant skins, you know, off an overturned milk crate. And so I said, oh, the divine creator wants me to put pheasant skin on the bird of North America. This is how I don't, I I gave up thinking years ago because I was always wrong about everything. So I just trust the divinity to direct uh, whatever needs to be in front of me as it happens, and I trust that. So that's how this came to be. That became an iconic book because there was a whole story about uh, in 1975, the Guild of Book Workers had an exhibition at the Arts of the Book Room in Yale, and I sent the Birds of North America uh, for the exhibition. 
And so here's the whole story. You can read it. Um, what, what happened was I, the report got back to me that the conservator who opened the package at Yale screamed when she saw the dead bird. And uh, they, uh, they pulled it from the exhibition. And Polly Lodomitsarsky, who I had met at the time of my Zabriskie show in 74, she came down to that because she was amazed that there was a book binder showing on 57th Street. And Polly was fabulous. She was maybe the most inspirational person I had met. And uh, that's how I met Rose Slifka from Craft Horizons. Polly was the bookbinding editor of Craft Horizons magazine. She had been married to Prince Valo Lada Mitsarski, uh, and he was a uh, OSS. You know what OSS was? The Office of Strategic Services was the predecessor to the CIA during World War II. And he was a spy in Germany, and he was an investment banker, and that was his cover for being a spy. And she would go with him to Germany, and he would go off for months at a time. And while she, he was doing that, she studied with Ignaz Wiemela, the great German bookbinder, probably the greatest German bookbinder of that century. And so she became very proficient. And by the time I met her, she had given her bookbindery to Yale that became the Yale Conservation Studio. And he was dead and had given his collection of Alaska Iana to, to Yale. Anyway, Polly, who was very important in the Guild of Book Workers as well, heard that they pulled it from the exhibition and she got Professor Norman Pearson, who was another muckety muck at Yale. And they were like trustees, you know, and insisted that that book go into the exhibition. Meanwhile, there was such a brouhaha about it that it made the headlines of the Yale student newspaper. And so people came to the exhibition to see it because nobody came to bookbinding exhibitions. So it actually served the function of getting people to come to an exhibition. It's back to the junior astronomy club ticket kind of thing again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, that, so I was there for the opening and the book was in the show and I came up with my, one of my apprentices. I, I had by that time five or six apprentices. But Debbie Gillen came up with me to see the show and uh, to photograph it for Book Arts Magazine. We were publishing Book Arts Magazine at that time. And it was gone. The, ex the book was not in the exhibition. I went to Dale Roylance, who was then the curator of the Arts of the Book Room. I said, Dale, where's the book? He said, oh, it was falling apart. So we took it out and put it in the Beinecke Library vault. I said, what do you mean it was falling apart? Bring it to me. Let me see. And he pointed and he said, yes, yeah, see, there are loose feathers. Well, actually, if I zoom in on this again, you can see the loose feathers. That was these feathers over here, right? Mm -hmm. you see, I pulled those feathers off. I threw them in the exhibition case and I said, put it back in there. I said, and if anybody asks, tell them the bird is molting. And I, and I said, Dale, and this, this is a, everybody in the Guild of Book Workers knows this story, by the way. So this, is, this has become like fundamental to, to the, American book binding, this particular story. Uh, so I said, Dale, what's the problem with this book? Why was it pulled from the exhibition? I don't get the problem. I said, it's, you know, he said, well, uh, how do you store a book like this uh, next to other books on the shelf? And how do you read it? And I said, Dale, you don't store it next to other books on the shelf. You display it like a sculpture. It's a work of art. This is book art. And I said, as far as reading it, why don't you take off all your clothes and put it in your lap? And he said, well, that would certainly be the erotic way. <laughs> so on the way back on the, to uh, the Center for Book Arts, uh, after I'd taken pictures of the exhibition, and so I'm going back with Debbie and she says, let's take a picture for Dale of how to read the birds of North America. So she sat me nude on the eight by 12 Chandler and Price at the Center for Book Arts with the book in my lap. Now, the photograph of that is here. I don't think I can show it on your program because last time I, I used to use this in my sideshow all the time and everybody laughed because it was so funny. But last time I showed it in a Zoom session, I was practically drawn and quartered and there were complaints of sexual misconduct uh, that I actually showed women this picture. They asked me to show them the picture and I showed it to them <laughs> and, uh, and I got hell for it. I sold the book and the buyer insisted that the picture go with the book because she was giving it as a gift to newlyweds <laughs> and she wanted the newlyweds to know how to read it. So uh, this is a true story. 
And uh, so do not click this link that says how to read it if you're at all squeamish about seeing that a man may have uh, male organs. And I know that half the people watching this have an organ like this, but uh, that, is the, uh, that is the birds of North America. Actually, um, th that was brought up when I, you know, I was given the Guild of Book Workers Lifetime Achievement Award a couple of years ago. If you go back to the uh, home, you, you got my homepage on here now, right? Yeah. And it says Guild of Book Workers, watch the video of the award presentation. What does a society do with someone so clearly ahead of its time? Well, for one, they ban contemporary books and they ban contemporary books. Okay. Yeah. Birds of North America from the Guild of Book Workers <laughs> exhibition. Yeah. <laughs> We all know the story okay, of the so, skin clad book whose inclusion in the Guild's 100th anniversary exhibition was recognition of and testament to just how ahead of his time Richard Minsky has been. Okay, so, um, you know, so th there's, th so th you could see the laughs that that got because everybody knows that story in that picture. So just by referring to it, uh, she got, um, uh, uh, you know, some uh, hilarity going uh, on at that Guild of Book Workers uh, uh, standards of excellence seminar <laughs> but that, that that book was placed uh, uh, not by me in, in the historical section at the Grolier Club of the Guild of Book Workers Centenary Exhibition the 100th anniversary of the Guild of Book Workers in 2006 um, so that Birds of North America was put in there as one of the key um, books of, uh, of uh, Guild of Book Workers history so, and after the exhibition, Yale got in touch with the couple who had been given it, who had loaned it to the exhibition in, in 2006, and Yale bought it for the arts of the book room, along with the photograph. So the Yale photograph. now <laughs> has that book and that photograph in the uh, Robert B. Hess Family Archive Special Collections at Yale University. So the bird has come home to roost. Yeah, and we will definitely have to cut cut this uh, photograph from our from our uh, podcast because uh, YouTube will ban us if we will yes, post a video. I, I think <laughs> this it's photograph, but, but you got but, nice to have some clarity. Our our viewers definitely do not <laughs> have to go <laughs> through this link that we will post below to to not 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 to see the photograph. <laughs> no, no, you post the link to that first picture. And think, you know, there are layers. People have to see the picture and then want to read about the book's trip to Yale. And after they read yeah. about the book's trip to Yale, then they can click on the link. And that way yeah. they will have the story and the link will, and the picture is presented in context, which is important, yeah. you know. But um, anyway, uh, all, all, these, all these things. And of course, birds of North America, the reason it's funny is, you know, birds, uh, the bird is a, um, uh, a euphemism or a slang term for the uh, uh, for a cock, which is a form of bird. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so yeah. uh, when you talk about birds of North America, that's the double meaning of that photograph. Uh, I, I I had I had some experience with uh, uh, with uh, with uh, the word cock uh, uh, some time ago when I was a child, and uh, uh, I think it was uh, 1993. I was visiting United States uh, uh, with my father, and we we stayed at uh, our friend's house uh, uh, on on Russian River in in California. And uh, well, of course, it would be the Russian River. Of course, of course, Russian River. <laughs> what else? And and that was a Russian family. They uh, the grandparents emigrated in uh, something like 1920s or 1930s long time ago and uh, uh, they had some grandchildren who were almost my age and uh, uh, they were uh, sort of trolling me and joking around and uh, uh, they were uh, repeating and repeating the word uh, uh, Russian word pitushok which is cock for uh, uh, which is uh, uh, stands for cock in English and I was I, I didn't understand what did they mean but they will they, they will uh, they were talking about penises yeah. uh, but, in their childish way oh, but, but that in was Russian, Russian land, word for the rooster you're saying for for the rooster yeah, yeah. Uh, but but uh, in the, in the Russian uh, in the Russian language uh, pitushok uh, it it sort of has this connotation uh, some sexual connotation in in uh, in uh, prison talk 
in prison uh, 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 argo, but uh, it doesn't have uh, this uh, this meaning in in you know in in popular uh, language, and uh, and the uh, meaning in in the in the prison talk is a bit different. It's about the person who was sexually abused. Uh, uh, by an, by another male person so it's 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 absolutely different context and uh, well as a child i didn't know about it as well so <laughs> that was my first experience with cox <laughs> uh, I, I i i have an you know, sort of intermediate question because if uh, if one goes to your wikipedia page there is like a section this big about your experience uh, in a second life universe. Uh, I was uh, I was going to ask, was it your first experience exhibiting and working in uh, uh, artificial virtual environments? So is your interest uh, uh, towards uh, computers and Internet and related technologies? Does it does it start earlier? When did you first become oh, interested that, in that, that, your that, that goes way back. My son, I was always interested. My science fair project in high school was a logical design for a binary robot programmer. And I built a punch paper tape pin reading device, you know, that would, you know, connect and, you know, light up different lights. And I, I made a, a logical design for a program that would uh, uh, determine the pH of a substance uh, with a robot arm, you know, that. Uh, but uh, so it goes back to that. Uh, my first year in college, because I was in physics and um, I had to uh, study machine with logic, logic, you know, the whole subject of logic, machine logic and computer programming. You know, this is like a four credit course in computer programming where I learned how to program an IBM 360 computer in machine language on punch cards where you're putting one command on each card and you have like 10,000 cards and stacks that you slip and, and, and have to try and get them back in order. The exciting time was the following year when we got, we being the economics department, by then I was in economics, got an Olivetti magnetic card reader and one magnetic card could hold 100 commands. You know, that's a one single, you know, eight bit string of commands on one card. So instead of 10,000 cards to drop, you had 100 cards to drop, which was much uh, less likely to drop and easier to fix when you pick them up, you know? So it goes back. So I have, so I come from, uh, I look at computers as, you know, you were talking about languages and translating. And I, I think in machine language with computers, so, so to speak, which is strings of ones and zeros, you know, and logical operators like and and or. So I come from that. So it was very natural for me when Second Life came out to jump in there into it as a virtual world and start an art gallery and uh, publish an art magazine because I, you know, since Junior Astronomy Club, I'd been doing uh, magazines about this or that, you know, whether it was mimeograph, or whatever. And by then, of course, by 2006 or seven, I was able to create a PDF magazine and issue it as a virtual object. Uh, in Second Life, and there were kiosks that, that were available to distribute things in. So I was able to sell my magazine in kiosks in every art gallery in Second Life. And I also published a physical uh, mag art magazine, which I may be able to show you. Um, anyway, it was called um, SLART, S-L-A-R-T. That was my gallery name. And I trademarked that, SLART. I got a United States trademark. You know, and you have to, uh, in order to get a trademark, you have to cross state boundaries with the product, which of course the internet did. And I had products and I had an almanac. I had different things of different categories for my trademark, all of which I had issued as virtual objects. So I was able to be the first patent to patent virtual objects and get a United States patent issued. Well, the trouble came when uh, somebody else opened a SLART gallery and I owned the trademark. Second Life had promised to protect its users' intellectual property. That was one of the things. That means copyrights, trademarks. Well, it turned out they didn't protect my intellectual property. I asked them 
to interfere. I, uh, you know, I told that owner of that gallery that I owned the trademark not to do it. They didn't change it. I said to Second Life, please, you said you'll protect intellectual property. Well, it was interesting. They did a takedown of that Slart Gallery and took it down, notified the owner, but did not tell them that it was my trademark. They made it as though it was their trademark. And um, I had a big argument about with them. I told them they can't, that they, that's my trademark, blah, blah, blah. And they were arguing and arguing with their legal department, this dopey girl who, that's another story, but anyway, so I took them to court. I went to federal court because it was an interstate issue. They were in California. So I went to Fed United States court in Albany, New York and filed a trademark infringement suit against the owners of the Second Life, uh, Linden Lab uh, Research Inc. Uh, which you can read online if you go to 3dinternetlaw.com, all the papers except for the final agreement that we ended up coming to an agreement uh, on it. Um, the agreement is confidential, so that paper is not, but all of the other paperwork. So I spent you know, a year or so writing court briefs. No, it's not the first court case I prosecuted. Uh, when, when, when the city of New York stole my Cadillac, I took them to court too. Uh, and uh, uh, one, but um, the uh, I mean, that was another. There's another whole crazy story. Uh, how how, how um, but anyway, I'm not going to tell that one now. But uh, <laughs> since you asked about Second Life, that's what that was about. It was a trademark infringement, and in the end, uh, I worked out a deal with them where uh, they they could have the trademark, and uh, you know I could uh, have what I wanted in terms of uh, compensation, which is an undisclosed. Uh, 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 settlement. And the, um, what was interesting is so I had Slart, ma I created Slart Magazine is the point. And um, do I, I don't, you know, I, I think I gave my copy to Yale. I don't, do I have, I don't even know if I have another copy of it. I don't think I kept the copy to myself. But, um, uh, but Yale has a copy of Slart and I have already distributed a bunch of my, I did a limited edition publication, a soft cover and a hard cover limited edition, but what I can show you is, um, I also had a website and I still have the website. Yeah. Okay, Art World Market was the name of my avatar in Second Life. So I went around everywhere and I had many different incarnations. I was male, I was female, I was black, I was white, I had many different incarnations, you know, cause you know, you just press a button and you're, uh, and you're entirely different, you know? So I, I, I was a collector. You know of uh, of art, some fabulous art was being done. So um, I, I kept the website going a little longer than that. But if you go there, if you just go to uh, MinskyReport.com, it'll take you here. But here's some just to give you an idea. So these are some of the uh, features that I had in the magazine. Here are some of the avatars uh, of the artists who I uh, featured uh, in the magazine. So you get to get a bit of a sense of uh, how creative, uh, there were a lot of musicians there. See, this thing here was a, a vehicle that flew. It was a two seat vehicle. So there's one of this guy who was, who was, who was a musician. And that, that was one of my avatars as Art World Market, an old black man. Uh, we're flying in this giant uh, crustacean thing. Um, uh, it's called a, uh, Fred the Flying Ammonite, created by Bathsheba Dorn. So uh, I got, uh, you can see this here is an avatar of, of a, a, a scope. So these were people who were pretty advanced uh, at programming and VR and uh, AR. Uh, this avatar, uh, Dan Coyote Antonelli, I was just had a Zoom session with him in real life yesterday because we, we are both doing NFTs now, but he was one of the top three uh, artists in Second Life. Here's in the, behind him is an artwork by another artist who was written up in the New York Times there and who I co-published an edition of this artwork that he showed in Second Life as a physical edition. So I was always into combining physical, there's another avatar of mine as uh, that hot chick. And uh, so anyway, uh, you can, if you go there, you can get a very good sense of, um, what that art world's like. So, and if you click on them, this was Sabine Stonebender's world. She created her own 
um, uh, environment uh, like that, that you know you could walk through and fly through and the like. So if you go there, you can see all these features of uh, some of them are PDFs. Um, you know, and when you see a PDF, it's the same as what was in the magazine that was distributed in a, in a kiosk. So these are all, some of it was political, some of it was environmental. There was a lot of, you know, I'm attracted to that kind of stuff. Anyway, that's since you ask about Second Life, that's, that's mm -hmm. about Second Life. I'm, I'm really curious about why there wasn't much in terms of this kind of artistic interaction uh, online and selling digital art in between Second Life and NFTs. Because I've heard a lot about what happened uh, inside Second Life, I only visited uh, briefly myself, but uh, where, why didn't it uh, evolve if, into something else? Why didn't it, it just fizzled out at some moment? It still exists. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking of going there and making an art gallery that sells NFTs. There's no reason not to be able to do that. You know, the NFTs essentially, you know, you can have, they are either, um, uh, objects that are programmed objects like VR or AR objects, which you can import into Second Life, or they're uh, JPEGs or GIFs or some other kind of image. They're, they are in some format that is an electronic format and almost all of them can be imported. So just like you saw Fred the Flying Ammonite that I could fly in, they can be functional objects that you can create and you can uh, import and will actually function using, you know, one of the reasons, no, I mean, Second Life itself has evolved and has evolved its platform. And there are several other platforms now that have developed that a third party that you can go into Second Life with. This, it's very expensive making, remember they had 15 million members back in 2007, eight, something like that. You know, people who had at least been in there once, you know, and um, or had unique identities, that many unique identities. Some of them may have been the same people with multiple identities, but you know, I don't know how many, but, the reality is that kept on going. Some people I know, occasionally I go back in and say hello to people that are in there still. And as I said, the, uh, um, DC, uh, DC, David Spensley, who uh, was Dan Coyote's DC Spensley's Dan Coyote, Antonelli and that, um, uh, who is still doing work like that on other platforms. I can, I'll say, I can send you links separately to other works that he's doing that are st still immersive worlds. He did entire shows with many people and their avatars as dancers. He had the sky dancers uh, who did a 3D, he created these huge, which were in virtual space, thousands of feet uh, large and high um, graphical environments that were kinetic. And he created costumes that the avatars could wear that were costumes made of light. And he created these light performances where, the, uh, where these dancers would in real time dance in the light and he would commission uh, compositions for them to dance to. And uh, you can go, if you look at him on that page of mine, there are links to videos of those performances. So, uh, so no, we're talking what, 15 years ago now, more or less. And, uh, but he is still uh, active in the uh, 3D immersive environments, but he's doing it now in diff There are many other gallery environments. It's not that nothing happened afterwards. It's just that you haven't been going into them. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm keeping my eye on this kind of art and there weren't that many uh, things that press talked about. There were small shows. I know that, uh, that it went on, but now suddenly, is it just because uh, there is an influx of money? Yes. That always helps. Yes. <laughs> or, or is it something uh, uh, more important? I've been talking uh, recently to uh, a friend of mine who is an uh, an anarchist philosopher sort of and he uh, he often talks about how uh, 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 dark ideas of uh, walter benjamin with uh, things losing their aura of authenticity etc uh, they are they haven't really realized now we have authenticity and aura, the only aura that capitalism accepts, you know, money and all that, things that are valuable are real, that this, uh, this sort of gives new blood to digital art and gives more attention and 
do, do you think it's that or is it just that it's time for uh, for this all what is it for you why am i doing it you mean uh which is all i can say everyone's you know they're collectors collect things first of all so one of the things is uh collectors love the hunt and the chase and they find something that interests i mean there's there are things that are as nfts that are not generally collectible elsewise they're you know these digital files this makes them into a collectible with a market and collectors tend to like markets some collectors like things like that don't have markets like matchbooks or business cards and uh and some people have built up collections that are phenomenal collections of things that nobody thought was valuable until they amassed like several thousand of them and there was an exhibition of them and then someone said hey i never thought that was interesting you know there's there's um there's all of those things for one thing it's uh it's fun so second life was fun there were a lot of parties in second life and there were a lot of artists and you got to meet a lot of interesting artists i i have the i have artists who are still friends of mine to this day as i said just yesterday i was in a zoom with one with one you know one of them and uh, so you get to meet people and in the nft space you get to meet other artists who are doing nfts and you get to meet collectors and right now i'm working on developing a virtual world for the hick at nunk platform which uses the tezos blockchain which is a green blockchain it's a proof of stake not a proof of work so it doesn't burn huge amounts of electricity and you can mint an object for like eight cents you know so it's not expensive to get involved in uh, as an artist and there are still things that sell for hundreds or even thousands of dollars in there because a lot has to do with it. if an artist on a social media platform has got a million followers can still develop a limited edition thing or a one-of-a-kind thing that will be valuable because they have a large following and enough of that following has money that wants to play and help support that artist so one of the things is it's a medium in which people can support an artist who is doing digital work and it's expanding into being able to support an artist who's doing non-digital work that you can also have a digital trail for like uh i can what i'm working on right now is getting a piece ready to go on the blockchain in tezos where it'll sell for what it would sell for in dollars, but in Tezos and is part of an NFT in that when you buy the NFT, you also get sent the object and the NFT becomes your proof of ownership. And the only way you can sell the object is by selling the NFT. Uh, so uh, otherwise, you know, if you disconnect it, it no longer um, has meaning. So as an artwork, it ties the NFT and the physical object together. As, as you've seen, I, I used to do things in Second Life where I would do performance in New York City or elsewhere in real time in a gallery space uh, which, in which I'd have a big screen set up in which Second Life was projected. And I had cameras set up on the audience in New York and there was an audience scattered around Second Life and in several groups where they have, there was, you, you have TVs in Second Life. And so, uh, I was able to have the Second Life people on a big screen in New York and the New York on the screens in Second Life. And at the Second Life conference in California, I did one of these performances about crossing worlds where the Second Life and real world would be simultaneously in the same space. So I'm, I'm a big fan of things that combine uh, the virtual and the actual. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any, anyway, uh, during our uh, uh, previous stream, when, when you joined, uh, you uh, posted some, some links uh, to, uh, to the binding uh, that, uh, and, and talked about NFTs, commented about NFTs. Uh, so uh, can you talk a bit more about this object about the uh, what is what what part of it is nft and uh, well okay how it was envisioned and uh, uh... i understand what you're saying uh let me go to um okay here are four nfts i've made um uh one of the this one here is a uh, photo of my book, It Can't Happen Here, of my binding, I should say, on the first edition of Sinclair Lewis's book. Um, 
which uh, is may, maybe what you're talking about. Um, yeah, exactly. Okay. And uh, right now, see if I uh, see here's the information about it. For example, uh, I made ten of them. Right, it's an addition of ten of this NFT. None of these actually have the real book go along with it. But I'm thinking about doing it for this book, which is a uh, price. Uh, uh, Ian Kahn of Lux Mentis Books has it for sale for thirty-five thousand dollars, for example. So I could sell, and I've, I just started talking to him about should we do this as an NFT, which means someone would pay thirty-five thousand dollars for an NFT, and Ian would mail them the book. Mm -hmm. It would be that simple. Um, and um, you know, and then I would have to like figure out how to do the commission thing and all that on the sale, but um, all that, and it describes it here. And the, the difference is that that one in the description would say includes the actual book that is in the photograph. And that would be the difference. And if anybody's interested in that book, um, the the way to i guess learn about it would be to let's see we I, we can go we could do it this way like like what you were saying uh are I, you seeing I, my website here now yeah i, I should mm -hmm. probably add that uh, during that stream we discussed nfts in general and uh, i was curious if uh, uh, uh digital books could be nfts uh, uh, and you replied uh, in, in the comments and uh, told us that uh, not only digital books can can be NFTs, but uh, uh, original bindings uh, uh, could could also be uh, NFTs of, of. And that's and that's how you do it. Yeah, and uh, um, well, and this... I'm just trying to find out where it is somewhere on on this website. And am I right in thinking that if you make something uh, into NFT, uh, you will get uh, a percentage of any future sales, not just of the original one? Yes, I, I, you, can, you don't have to take that, uh, but it becomes part of what's called a smart contract. Uh, in the case of this one here, if you look at it, um, when you look at the, uh, uh, this and its history, you see that it was minted on this date, there's an addition of 10 and there are 10% royalties. That means it's part of the smart contract. Automatically, when someone buys it, 10% of that, if they if someone sells it, ten percent of whatever they sell it for comes to me. That's what's called a smart contract. Once you put or you can put whatever amount you want as your royalty. It could be zero. It could be one hundred percent. But you know, ten uh, percent I think is kind of a nice normal kind of royalty. But um, uh, but that's what a royalty is, and that's the nice thing about it for selling artworks. There's not too many other kinds of artwork that you get a royalty for. Anyway, so back to navigating the website. Um, uh, if you go to the chronological catalog where everything is, uh, there's it can't happen here. You'll see there's three different versions of it. There, I did three bindings. And uh, here it is, that's my blood and acrylic paint, which is all the same color in this photo that I took uh, at the time I made it. But if you look at a picture of it uh, later on, uh, and then where is that picture? There should be a picture of it somewhere later on. I guess it's not on this page. Uh, yeah, you'll see that uh, the blood starts turning brown and uh, the, um, uh, so I did my own bed blood and matched it with acrylics. And that way, as the blood turns brown, you can tell what's the blood and what's not, you know, over time. But um, uh, if you don't know the story of, um, of why this is covered in eight point type and blood and Vermont vigilance, you can uh, read what Vermont vigilance is by clicking that and it explains the uh, story and why binding has to do with the metaphors of the book. I'm not gonna go into that right now, but um, the key thing is that's, that's the, uh, the picture that this is of. So if you wanna know more about, there's a li that link is here uh, along with in the NFT so that people who don't know what it is can learn more about it. So uh, there's that, but getting back to the, um, like what, what else to do with the book. See, the thing about it is like, you can animate things in NFTs. Like this was my uh, uh, chart of the Dow Jones Industrial Average in 1929. Uh, and this one that's going up is uh, this year um, uh, through April. 
And uh, so it's, it's a, a fun way of seeing uh, how history repeats. Uh, and this one here is of a handmade paper pulp work. This one also is going to be an NFT that you get the real thing for. Uh, in uh, 1990, when I was an uh, artist in residence at Oxbow, which at that time was the uh, Summer School of the Art Institute of Chicago, I was an uh, artist in residence in hand paper making. And this is done in paper pulp, like, you know, squeeze bottles of paper pulp in color. And that's a self portrait I did at that time. See, it looks just like that without my glasses. And um, I had hair, I had more hair than here. Um, <laughs> So what I've done is that, that I just, I, I'd forgotten all about this until a few couple of months ago, I got uh, a JPEG of that from uh, this school that owned the paint. They, they, they owned that original mm -hmm. and uh, college and they wanted me to sell, there was some question they had about it and they wanted to know details. So I took that JPEG and I, I'm making prints of it. Um, with a little bit of a 3D shadow, so it looks three-dimensional, you get a sense that it's cast paper and not just flat art. And then I'm going to make that. So I just started making these prints. And uh, this NFT is going to come with a print of the, uh, of, with a print of it. And this one over here is um, Minsky in Bed, the story of my love life uh, in the style of the Incanabula. And uh, it's a uh, PDF of, of the book. And which I did uh, from 1987 to 96 and bound them. I only made three copies. I was going to make more, it was supposed to be an edition of 10, but it took so long that the software kept going obsolete. And by the time I was done, I couldn't make any more copies from the files I'd created. You know, and I'd gone through several printers. So, and originally, it really is computer in Canabula because that was when I, I bought a Canon. Uh, BJ 130 in nine, right after my 1988 Zabriskie show, I showed in that show, I can show you what I showed in that show here. If we go to, um, I can just type in Minsky, Minsky in bed in, uh, over here in the search function on my website, and it'll say Minsky in bed. And I can go there and you see at the top, there's a picture. This was a, taken at the Zabriskie gallery in 1988. Uh, you see Minsky in bed is handcuffed to the bed. Um, it's a chain binding. I always like chain bindings. You know, I had you know, there's a, that chain binding on the cover of the Effects of Time that I posted on your Discord. Yeah. And um, I've always been attracted to chain bindings and done a number of them for different. So I use the chain metaphorically, not just as a, you know, the way it was traditionally used. But anyway, there's the chain handcuffing the book to the bed, which I thought was appropriate. And you see these little sculptures of a copulating couple rotated to a different position on the cover. And uh, when you well, you'll, you can see somewhere a, uh, a close up of this uh, that the chain is attached to that you also can't show on your um, YouTube channel. But um, so that was at the Zabriskie Gallery. There, that was an interesting exhibition because it was all books on social and political themes, which uh, I can talk about that. That's, that's probably another subject we should talk about because that's an important subject actually. But anyway, so that was my prototype. It just had one letterpress printed chapter and I was composing it on the computer and then having a magnesium engraving made and printing it in black and then hand coloring and gilding the pages, very much like it was done in Gutenberg's time. And uh, so I called it Computer in Canabula. And what happened was right after that show, Canon K, I saw an ad, or actually it wasn't even an ad, it was a newspaper announcement of the Canon BJ-130 bubble jet printer an inkjet printer with a 14 inch wide carriage. And I called up Canon and said, will that print on thick sheets of handmade paper? And they said, uh, we don't know, you wanna try it. So I tried it and I found a handmade paper, Richard Debat paper that it worked with. And actually that's one of the reasons I was an artist in residence to do that other work because Richard Debat changed their formula and the inkjet no longer worked on it. So when I was artist in residence, I developed a new paper for printing inkjet and then had Judenay paper mill, make the paper with my watermark in it that I could print the, and finish the Minsky in bed with. But anyway, see, there's the copulating couple. And, uh, and, and then there's all the chapters. So you can actually read this entire book online. See, there's my introduction. See, now this is artwork. It's not a photograph. So you can probably show this. Uh, well, I don't know if you can show that. But um, 
Uh, let's see, what do we have here? Um, anyway, so you see there's, uh, there's all these little uh, mini erotic miniatures, let's call it that way, that illustrate the stories. But you see it like the Incunabula, I wrote the text in the first person past, my accurate recollections, as accurate as they may have been, of the time, I changed everybody's name, you know, in it to protect myself. And, uh, uh, and then the text I wrote as a commentator, because commentaries, what you had, it was Talmudic, it was in the style, you know, then it was always classical text with a, so I wrote this to look like an incunabulum, uh, as well as being printed in black and hand colored and illuminated. It also had a text in the commentary and the commentary I wrote in the third person present from the point of view of a narrator who knows things that Minsky isn't talking about in his narrative. So if anybody wants to read Minsky in bed, you, you don't have to, you can't buy the uh, uh, NFT because it's not for sale. There was actually only two copies of this NFT and uh, I gave one to uh, DC who I was on the uh, Zoom with yesterday, the artist from Second Life who's also doing NFTs. We trade NFTs and um, which is fun. And it's another reason to do NFTs. You get to trade them with people. But uh, so you don't have to look at it there. You can actually go to the website and read the whole book. But uh, I'm actually planning to, some of the pages are good in terms of reproductive quality. Some are not very good because they were made from photocopies that I made like in 1980s. And it wasn't, then I got a digital camera and then a scanner. And so the quality improved. So I actually don't have, so I have to find one of these three copies that exist. Like copy number one's in the Victoria and Albert Museum. I know where to find that one. So one of these, I'm gonna go and really photograph the pages of with a high quality resolution. And I'm thinking of then issuing an NFT of high quality and also doing a physical limited edition, second edition of the book. And if anyone wants to enter, the uh, uh this uh, newly imagined emerging markets is it difficult do you have to be technically savvy what do you have to do you have to have a uh, an image you can have a jpeg or a gif i'm at the very least you know uh, the more technically savvy the more interesting the you know it'll be what you do uh and you know i, I tend to collect uh, here I, I i can show you what i collect in there, uh, see if you go to, I'm Masterbinder there and in Twitter and here and there, that's my name in places. If I click collection, you click anybody's and you get to see what it is they collect. And you see, I collect things that are, you know, immersive and animated and things that are sculptural that are, you know, that, that, that are media that are, um, here you see my collection, you know, on this platform, right? And you get to see, uh, you know, the, some of the things that are, um, you know, created using programs that, um, you know, th that do things. And uh, that, that's what interests me. But, uh, you know, there's collectors of everything. And where, uh, where can you connect to other artists that work in, in, in this uh, medium? Is there like a platform where you can interact with them when you can talk? Or do you just have to find them on other social media? It's funny that you ask that because um, at the moment, let's see if I can find this. Um, I took part in a thing called a hickathon, which is like a hackathon for Hick at Nunk. You know, um, all or nothing, Hick at Nunk is the name of uh, Hick at Nunk uh, dot XYZ is, the, is their website where you uh, see all of, uh, all of these things. But um, are you, is it sharing that? Do you see it? H yeah. equals N, Hick yeah. at Nunk, yeah. right? And so uh, would I, I, at this Hickathon, I joined the uh, work group 6.1 uh, the HEN ecosystem, Metaverse and Beyond. And I joined with the role of tester because I thought, I see I'm down here as tester. And uh, there's my wallet. So I, I, when you get, I get bounties for doing this. You know, they, they actually give you uh, Tezos for, for doing stuff. And so these are the people who, um, you know, were in it. And it's about creating a Metaverse. And we proposed to create a, meta, uh, a Metaverse that people could go in where you could display, each artist would get a world and in their world, they could put their NFTs or a collector could put their NFTs to show or to sell or just to have an exhibition. 
and you would have an avatar and you could go in there and as a collector or a curator, you can talk to the artist and stand in front of, with your avatar, the work that's under discussion and ask whatever questions you want. The artist can explain themselves if that's of interest and you could click on it and buy it. The, the, I think there is great future in front of all this. So that, that, that was the concept, right? This, uh, this, this is inevitable. I've been reading all my life about, uh, about this and it was always like 20 or 30 years in the future and like like fusion power it exists right now they if you're on there they, they exist right now on the ethereum blockchain uh there are galleries that you can go into and do this and uh because the ethereum is you know which i'm not in because of its environmental impact mm -hmm. uh but what i i'm uh, that's why i'm working towards developing one of these for hick at nunk because i think uh and it won't just be for hick at nunk it'll be for any well, we're thinking right now of any platform that is on the Tezos blockchain, uh, which is what Hecat Nunk is on, and then probably expanding it to any platform that is on any proof of stake blockchain. That means one that is not gobbling up electricity and that is uh, you know, low cost for artist entry. The great thing about the low cost for artist entry is we have artists it became, in just a few months after it started, which was around March this year, it became the dominant platform for NFTs in terms of quantity, not in terms of sales price, because it's so fairly cheap. But all of a sudden, there were over 100,000 within just a couple of months NFTs uh, on the market in it because the cost of entry was low. So we have from all over Africa and South America and Asia and everywhere, artists who are kept out of the Ethereum blockchain because we're cost 60 or $200 to mint an object and the objects are expensive. And here people find a market and other artists to trade with and it can, might cost you eight cents to mint an object as opposed to $80 or a hundred or $200 to mint an object. So your gas cost as it's, as it's called is very low. It's thousands of uh, of a Tezo, of a Tez, you know, or a Tezos, uh, which is XTZ is the trading currency, which runs about seven dollars per unit. So you know, a hundredth of that is you know seven cents, which might be what it costs you to mint an object. So it's uh, it's a very different thing, and it also is uh, opens up this world of NFTs to just about any artist in the world who has access to a computer. We'll see how it goes, but uh, I, I'm, I'm as well as, as Pavel, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in, in how it, it all evolves and uh, where it leads all of us. And uh, well, we'll see. And will it make a better world? I am, I am very much hopeful. Every time I uh, hear about uh, yet uh, another iteration of making uh, uh, Bitcoins or Tezos or any other, uh, 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 electric, uh, electrical currency better, I'm very, very hopeful that it will finally make a better world. I'm so, so not impressed with the world we are living in that ever any improvement like that well, <laughs> things, uh, well, makes me sing inside. That's so sad. Um, I, uh, uh, my, I offer my condolences to you, but I, I have no hope. Uh, I, 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 I uh, have not had a hope for many decades, and uh, a hope to me is a uh, the only thing hope can lead to is disappointment. You know that there's really no other um, thing uh, uh, hope can can give. Uh, it's it's kind of for me a non-emotion. I, I am a man of faith. I have faith. I have faith that uh, uh, the actions that I'm taking are uh, uh, I uh, that I will figure out how misdirected they are before they create too much tragedy, a uh, tragedy, and uh, mm -hmm. I will come up with a strategy to avoid tragedy. And uh, with that, some of the things I do might make the Pareto optimum, you know, uh, which is, yeah. well, for you know, um, uh, if, if for those in the audience who don't, the Pareto optimum is one person in the world is better off and nobody is worse off. And that's all I look for. 
Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Richard, for this talk. I also wanted to say thanks to you for supporting us on Patreon. Everybody should support you on Patreon. It's, uh, it's very important that you can afford to do this. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, th thanks a lot for that. And I should say that uh, all the money that comes from Patreon goes to editing of this video. So uh, that's not like we are profiting from that. <laughs> Even more, we have to add our own, own money to, to do all this uh, uh, stuff with, uh, with our project. Uh, so if you, if you like what we do and uh, you are considered helping us in any way, please check the link below in the description. Pledges start with only $1, $1, euro, one pound, depending on where you live. Or if you have more money, start with $100 or 1000 uh, They really uh, are doing <laughs> good things with it. And if you have the money, there are very few places you are going to put it uh, and they'll do something special for you if you do that. That's absolutely true. We'll, we'll find, find some way to, you know, get even. And uh, thanks to all of our watchers, uh, viewers, uh, thanks to members of our community. You can uh, see these the future videos uh, on our YouTube channel and you can uh, listen to this podcast on our SoundCloud account and our podcasting platforms. You will find all the links below. Uh, you'll find links to the objects, to the pages describing the objects we talked about and to Richard's website uh, uh, in the description as well. And uh, see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.